over to the horse. Yeah, hold, hold still, little. You shoving it up her ass? Presses. I feel like I've lost my sanity watching simply. these ads. <laughs> one of my favorite channels. Let's go. All right, we've done theater, we've done painting, we've done wine, and, and now, now it's time next? to do some drinking stuff in general. And to start, let us learn Fancy about drinking. the drinking cultures of the world. I should become a female Welcome YouTuber. I could be insane. Day. Can you? I feel like you're pretty like mild, so you gotta step it up a little bit. Come on, kid. I got a lot to teach you about the world. Like Lucy? Lucy's too lewd. But she is nuts. We must learn. Bro, all what the hell? What is with these flying thingies? Why do they look like fat cheeks? God damn. We must learn all of the drinking customs of all the funny foreign places. Starting I can with go where wacky. drinking was invented. The country of Uck. London. The trick is to jump just before you hit the ground. Wait, what? Observe British people in their natural habitat. Yeah, double jump. Here that makes sense. Thing called cheers, where they clink their glasses together before drinking. Cheers. The tradition dates back centuries, but the origin, why they started doing it, is somewhat unknown. Hmm. But we have a couple of theories. Theory one, poisoning. Yes. So imagine a situation like this. Two people who don't trust each other. Oh, so it's a way to start drinking. Oh yeah, you you put some poison in their drink, and you both have put poison in their drink, and they are like, yeah, let's let's start drinking. Cheers. That makes sense. Chella, sitting down together at the pub. This guy then does something shady to the other guy's drink. Ooh. Here you go. D definitely Did you looks normal. my drink? Me? I would never. Well then, I'll pour a little of mine into yours, and you can pour a little of yours into mine, and we'll both either be totally fine or oh, does that make totally sense? dead. No, no, there's there's no need to do that. So that was the initial version, and then eventually they just kind of shortcutted it to, yeah, clink, clink, it's fine, I trust you. But I don't think that's, that's it. That's probably a myth. So, theory number two. Ghosts. <laughs> right, in the Middle Ages, people were worried about spooky ghosts and spirits. So they do cheers very loudly to scare away the demons. Also, sometimes you'd spill some of your drink onto the table and the floor, and then that was like a little offering to the spirit. But that's probably also not true. The most likely answer is simply that everyone likes that sound. Ah, it's very satisfying. There's more. You know when someone drops a glass and everyone goes kind of silent, like, are you fucking And idiot? people scream, huzzah! Well, in the UK, instead, everyone goes, way Woo! in celebration. Yeah. As a way to make fun of you, but also make Because you if you're, like, making a bad situation, people are gonna be like, that's, that's ruining the vibe, right? But if everybody, like, cheer on, everybody feels good. So the guy doesn't feel too bad about losing his drink in the end of the day, and everybody just vibing and having a good time. Well, not so bad. Yeah. Uh-oh. The BBC. Oh my god. They have a whole organization for that now. Yeah, we they are. Out of here. We'll take my what private going on there. ship. Come, come to Italy, where they filmed the Mario movie. Let me just park this here. Chai, is this actually real? Yeah, it is. Come this way to the leaning tower of Pisa. <laughs> is this real? <laughs> held up by the raw strength of a thousand tourists posing for photographs. But did you know that Italians when they say cheers, say chin chin. Chin chin? Now, that is very funny to the Japanese because in Japanese, chin chin yeah. means penis. Mm -hmm. Germany next. Now here they do Bruderschaft, where you link your arms together when drinking. It's also kind of seen all over the world at weddings in particular, but only the Germans Oh, is that German? I didn't know it that. It symbolizes the end of formalities between two people. A brotherly kiss. Germans have a name for it. It symbolizes the end of... A brotherly kiss, a customary after emptying a glass, which can seal the ritual. Thence they are considered a good friend and address each other formally. Formalities between Informally. two oh. But the Germans have a lot more. It's a homie, now, when yeah. When you clink glasses together with someone, That's the you have to look them directly Jula. in the eye. You get and a little bit close. Do it, you will be cursed with Give seven a little years of on bad the sex, apparently. It's not my fault. It's the Germans. 
<laughs> then when doing shots in Germany, they sometimes also go Zermit, and you hold the glass near your belly. Zertit, and you hold it near your chest. And then Zum Sack, and you hold what? it near your, you know. And then Zack Zack, and you drink. Now, on to Finland. They keep it casual. They have a custom specifically for drinking alone. You're supposed to- That sounds like the most Finnish thing ever. To do it while loafing around in your underpants, and it's called Kalsari Kani, also known as underwear drunk. All right, that's all I could find what? in Finland. So off to Canada to get there. Wait, so you drink alone with just your underwear at? Okay. I mean, that's, that's a pretty good. fishing trawler. <laughs> it's so exclusive that even these fish, yes, they go to a private school. In Newfoundland, Canada, my favorite thing to do sounds like a good screech. thing to do. At, uh, yeah, you at a weekend. You take a shot of screech and oh, then you do the screech. Goes like this: Is you a screecher? And then you answer like this: Is he possessed by a demon? And long me your big jib jaw. That's it. I have never in my life been so drunk like this guy. I like because I feel like if I try to drink that much, alcohol doesn't have a big of an effect for me. But like if I try to drink as much to be like in this sort of sort of form, I gotta be dead. I gotta die. Cause this is insane. Gawk. And long me your big jib jaws. Yeah, That's long it. me your big jib jaws. Then they take a big fish, usually Slap a cod, it down, baby. Kiss it on the lips. We just be German? No, what I'm saying is that I can drink so much that it has zero effect on me. Because, but because of our mortal bodies, if I would drink at the point where I would behave like this, it would be literal alcohol poisoning that will kill me. Anyway, I'm kind of... I'm kind of busy, so uh, there's no more customs anywhere in the world. You can do some more, maybe uh, independent research yourself. I'll, I'll see you back in the field. Ooh. I don't know what was going on there. That was something. Okay, this next section is on cock. Oh, okay. Tales. So it all started when we made this asset where the Irish character. They know that the poison can kill you with a consent. Party. True. And I, I did not accept you, poison. I did not allow you to murder me. Poison, stay away. Let me drink in peace. <laughs> I did not accept you getting into my body. Nah. -uh. <laughs> yeah, that's where I went. Wait a minute, that's a weird word. Why are they called cocktails? And we started Googling it, and we kind of went down a rabbit hole, and it was actually really where should interesting. Where I send the book? So, oh, how many percentiles is that? Cocktails. I was going to say right now, I had a fucking, I had a, a girlfriend from one of those European countries that tend to very much love to drink. And I remember when I was at her, her uncle's place, he kept on giving me like seven types of different vodka in like a glass. He didn't give me a shot glass. He gave me a glass and he filled it up and he gave me seven types of different kind of vodkas. And then he came with like some kind of like cognac and stuff like that. And he kept giving me and giving me and giving me. My, I, because it's custom, I, I'm just like accepting it, being happy. Yeah, thank you so much. But God damn, did I feel like I'm going to die at the end of this? Because I thought I was going to get food, alcohol poisoning. <laughs> In the 1700s, fuel prices were outrageous. This vodka has coffee so flavor. Everybody used the horse. My God. Now, horses weren't just used for travel. They were also used for work in the fields. Ooh. So you would sometimes put a harness on a horse for plowing a field, right? Now, when you do that, its tail actually gets in the way. Cock so we flavor, yep. something about that thing. Think of it like the force. Why are we looking at a horse ass? How did we get here? Of the horse. You put it in the guillotine and everybody closes their eyes. Huh? No! Problem solved. Now, this practice is called docking. It has a different meaning these days. What? Yeah, I mean, so docking is a little bit of another situation nowadays. If the tail is docked, some say it's much easier to clean. But it also kind of looks like a chicken's tail, right? Hence, they would call these tails cocktails. Mm. So that's step one in the story. Talk, yep. Step two. You've also got horse merchants, right? And they are a very shrewd bunch. 
They know that when they sell their horses, the customer wants very feisty and energetic animals. Someone who's buying a horse doesn't want one that's kind of sickly or lazy or sleeping all the time, right? They need it for work. So how do you ensure then that your horse looks full of beans and moxie and some other stuff? You connect an engine to it, true. And has the maximum horsepower possible when it's time to sell. Well, they would use this one quick hack. <laughs> All the equestrians hate them. They would go over what? to their mortar and pestle and they would throw in some chili, hmm, some ginger and a few other spices and just mix it all together. Then they would go over to the horse and hold still little- You shoving it up her ass? How would you guys feel if somebody shoved chilies and ginger up your ass? If you woke up one day and suddenly you woke up, oh, there's chili and ginger up my ass. I think that's a bad day. I think that's a really bad day. <laughs> the best Mexican food hits you for two times though. <laughs> I mean, it's probably the same experience you'll have if you go and eat a Taco Bell. Fella, and with the mixture go up into the no-no area. Ooh. Yeah. Now, the horse doesn't like that very much. So it's kicking, it's going mad, and the bidders are all going, wow, this is a really great horse. It's got some spunk, I tell you. I'm buying it. So the horse merchants made a whole bunch of money. And everyone was happy. Well. Beside the horse. Almost everyone. Poor horses, the yeah. End. Of step two. Now step three. Around the same Why time. are we talking about horses when we were talking about cocktails and cocks and drinking? You've got bartenders over in the saloon Ooh. and they have just invented the science. This guy knows what he's doing. They've realized that you can add Red Bull and lemon juice to stuff and actually make alcohol not taste so bad. But when they added some ginger and spices and maybe a little bit of pepper, people went, oh, I know these. These are those horse suppositories. Cocktails, we'll call them. Close there is up. no way that's how they named cocktails. Because they shoved it up people's asses. No way. A glug and the name stuck. No, I don't believe this. I, I do not believe that. I it hope it's really real. Time. I don't that would be a good really story to tell time. when you're drinking. Oh no, help me, Incogni Man. I signed up for discounts at a retail store and they <gasps> won't stop sending me messages. Oh no. Huh? I signed up to that website years ago. Why are they still spamming me? <laughs> what? That would be my doing. I am Data Beast Man. <laughs> You've told that Who story 20 times him? now. I actually love having, I think it's something good to have like dumb stories to tell whenever you have nothing to talk about. Like, you know, whenever you're drinking, at least it's always nice to have like some sort of startup. It's me, Incogni Man. Incogni Man. Incogni is the brilliant service that tells a whole bunch of databases and people who have your data and stuff to get fucking lost. It yeah, says, get hey, the fuck out of there. this email address? Well, lose it. Hey, marketer man. You can't use this phone number anymore. Instead of chasing them all up manually by signing up to Incogni, they send these legal requests on your behalf to get you deleted from the internet. Let us do battle in my room. And then we teleport to the desert. I better follow him. Incogni portal. Good of you to finally join us. Yeah, well, I'm going to stop you. Incogni <coughs> lawyer powers, legal threats, data removal tools, consumer privacy act, I like data these, uh, protection regulations. Polite. These ads are something uh, else. They're, they're, they're something else, man. It has created a Gundam. So go to incogni.com slash incognito. Sign up today and get 60% off an annual plan. I won't change numbers. I wish he made 30 minute videos with only ads. I feel like they tell a story. And these stories should be heard. They should be set, sung upon and they should be mentioned a lot more. I love Don't them. Change email addresses. I feel like I've lost my sand in watching these ads. Take them back. I can feel it working. 
my phone isn't ringing as often. <gasps> my email inbox, it's less full. Wow. We've got just a whole bunch of shit. <gasps> and then like the sun comes out of the clouds. Wow, yeah. that's amazing. My databases are getting too light. I'm floating away. He'll die of the cold eventually. <laughs> Pan up and it's an old man. He's like, not bad, kid. <laughs> not bad at all. <gasps> So go to incogni.com slash incognito. Sign up today and get 60% off an annual plan. And over. Have you heard about the latest dangerous trend? It's all over social media. Wine mixed with watermelon. A combination when mixed together makes a deadly poison. Here we are in Argentina with a delicious watermelon. Now let me chase it down with a glass of <gasps> wine. <gasps> Oh my, how dare you, don't okay, die. It's not true, but it's been a myth in South America for over a hundred. Who believes this? Why would you believe that wine mixed with watermelon would kill you? You should never pair wine and watermelon together. No one quite knows why, but we dug and we dug and we were able to find a single source from an author, Facundo de Genova. And he says in probably Argentina, probably sometime in the 1800s, there was a small Catholic church and everything was great. For a time, they grew wine for dinner and watermelon for dessert. Until one day, something bad happened in their idyllic little town. Ooh. A few men in the village started getting a bit hmm, grabby. It was a whole Me Too thing, but it was the first Me Too. It was a Me One. No one quite knows me who did what to whom, but it was a big <laughs> scandal, I tell you. What? And it kept <laughs> Oh no, what's happening to our beautiful our village? They said in their funny foreign accents. Now, presiding over the village was a monastery. So the priests all gathered together at this monastery to figure out what the hell's going on with all this grabbiness. Yeah, this uh, town uh, sucks now, said the women folk. I hope you have uh, the plan to fix uh, this. Uh, yes, of course we do. But first, we must figure out why the men are becoming so grabby. Come on, guys, think outside the box. We have to find something, anything to blame, except the people who actually did the thing. So the priests began looking at the diets of the people in the village. Hmm. It's the watermelons. Yeah. It is definitely the watermelons. The priest said aloud. One of the monks proposed mm. a theory. Have you noticed that we grow a lot of grapes here? Mm. Yes. And have you noticed that we also grow a lot of watermelon? Mm. Yeah. Well, what if, you know, somehow... One of the monks proposed a theory. Have you noticed that we grow a lot of grapes here? Yes. And have you noticed that we also grow a lot of watermelon? Yeah. Well, what if... Yeah, what know, if we... <laughs> what if we do this, huh? Somehow, it makes the men folk grabby. Yeah. That must be it. We must put a stop to this. We gotta well, stop this well, no let's nonsense. Tell them that if they drink wine and eat watermelon, They'll go to hell. <gasps> okay. So that's what they did. Hear ye, yeah. hear ye. Do not drink wine and then eat watermelon. You'll go to hell. You'll go to hell, baby. Stop doing that. Stop being grabby. Oh, my God. Oh, really? Really? Oh, really? 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 See, I don't know that. Maybe it's really, really, really. And it worked. The assaults suddenly stopped. Hurrah. Although whether that was a coincidence, we don't actually know. Over time, however, the messaging kind of evolved because... Don't mix wine with watermelon isn't exactly a well-known Bible proverb, and people became less religious. So instead of, you'll go to hell, the line changed to, it's poison and you'll die. Um, that works. And in Argentina, in... I mean, a lot of people don't think about these things anymore, so why not just say that the worst outcome will happen? Some places the myth still perpetuates. Now, is there actually any evidence at all no. That pairing wine and watermelon together really causes the mood. Mm. Kinda. What? Watermelon contains an amino acid, arginine, which partially transforms into nitric oxide, and then nitric oxide is a vasodilator. And vasodilators 
uh, do this. Mm. Plus, wine also has polyphenols, and that also helps in the formation of nitric oxide. So, double this. Oh. But the effect from nitric oxide is actually very mild. Also, all of these foods have polyphenols and arginine in them as well. So pretty much everything has it. So, no, the effects are likely hugely overstated. So, the moral of the story is... I think, yeah, if you drink grape juice... No, not grape juice. If you drink, um... I don't remember. The red this orange. section is on wine in the Bible. Sort of. Apologies if we got any details wrong. We mostly kept the section because we liked the pun on Eucharist. Jumping forward to Jesus. Great ways this to slowly log out of life. <laughs> so, Jesus and a whole bunch of his followers and stuff, they are invited to a wedding in Cana. Now, the waiter goes over to serve some guests some wine and... Uh-oh. Oh. It's empty. We cannot have that. What do you mean it's empty? There's no more wine. <gasps> no, wait, I've got a plan, says Jesus. Ooh, our Lord and Savior, let's get drunk, baby. Bring me six big stone jugs, about 20 to 30 gallons each. Spoilers. And fill them up to the brim with H2O. Now, Jesus check out the this. Giga Chad. And he does the finger He's here thing. to save us all. And then when they went to pour the water, suddenly it was wine. And it was the best wine that anyone had ever had. And they go, oh, that's pretty good, Jesus. But have you got any other miracles? And he says, yes. Come on, we're going to... I think Jesus should have had a miracle to spawn, like, fried chicken or something like that. Just some way of, like, getting... Giving people more food. Because I feel like the drinking part, why are we talking about, like, the wine? We gotta get some... We gotta get some more going on. Holy... Do a supper. PoE? Yeah. Everyone what is gathered around, and this is the point at which Jesus reveals, by the way, one of you is very sus. Sussy. I know one of you will betray me. And he looks at Judas, Judas. and Judas is kind of looking away. Mm. But then Da Vinci's like, God. Mm, Who might it be? Hey, I need you to stay a still for the painting. So Jesus goes, watch this. And he takes some bread and wine, and he says, look at this bread. This is my flesh. And everyone's kind of like, really? And he goes, well, yeah, yeah. I mean, if you're Protestant, then just metaphorically. No, no, okay, look at this wine. It is my blood. Really? Quit making this so complicated. Here, have some. So he hands it to his disciples, and they went, fantastic. I was peckish and thirsty. And he goes, yes, in fact, I shall call this little celebration a Eucharist, or Holy Communion. It will be the practice of eating one cracker or piece of bread and drinking some wine. And Ooh. if you eat the whole thing... Wait, is it actually possible to get wine in these, like, dressing, like, containers? Of eating one cracker or piece of bread and drinking some wine. This has to be, like... This has to be Photoshop. Pre-filled communion cups. A uniquely designed cup that offers unleavened bread... Like, bread wafer and serving out of grape juice? Oh, it's just grape juice. Oh. Who would drink it from this little small shit? Oh! Why? And if you eat the whole thing and drink the whole bottle, that's called... Now that is an alcoholic. If you know somebody drinking wine from you this kind of glass... And drink the whole... That you know they are an alcoholic. Like, come on! Whole bottle? That's called... A huge correct. Yes, those are grape juice. Southern Baptists yeah, use them. Christians oh, really? Take that as a symbolic thing. One glass a day, Unless true. One glass a day, baby. Doctor said I can have one glass of water. Which means that the bread and wine <laughs> literally turns into the body and blood of Works Jesus. Works smarter, and not harder. A nice glass. True. However, it Less does still look like bread and wine. And they call that phenomenon appearance or accident. It has changed. But you just can't tell. Except for sometimes when you actually can. Lanciano, Italy, in the 8th century, there is a monk and he has been on r slash atheism for far too long. He is starting to have doubts about the blood and wine stuff. But he still has his monkly responsibilities. So, he holds mass and he says the words of consecration. This is my body. This is my blood. This is my rifle. This is my gun. 
And at that very moment, the bread turns into literal flesh in his hands. <gasps> and the wine turned to blood. Jesus, man. Holy Jesus, shit, the power of Christ. Unison. And ironically, he went, oh, well, I should probably not eat this then. So instead, he kept it in this chalice thing. What is it? A clock? Anyway, there it remains mm. still today, kept in the church of San Francesco. And now a couple of years later, in the 1970s, Professor Odaro Leone decides, let me do a bit of an experiment. So he took a sample of the flesh and he came to the conclusion that it was indeed real. Apparently, it was part of a heart valve and that the blood type was AB. The sample has not been analyzed since. However, it is officially recognized by the Roman Catholic Church. Here ends the reading. Now you might say, wow, that section really doesn't have a whole lot to do with wine. And in fact, you're just badly retelling a Bible story. This final section we started making for the main channel when we found this massive court document and we thought, Holy. Holy shit, this is a hell of a story. And we had all these ideas of it being like Witcher themed. And so there were quite a few like random Witcher assets, just ignore that. But it just kept blooming and blooming into this bigger story and it got too long. And so here it is on Incognito. And here we begin in 1743. The birth of Thomas Jefferson. Push oh Mrs. my Jefferson. lord, Push. what a great day. Now, Tom Jeff. Yeah. He was involved a with true some American. Kind of sexy, but you're too late. He's dead. Can you imagine if Thomas Jefferson was actually like kind of this super giga chat, like absolutely ripped and a maniac? That, that would be a great depiction of him. But oh, wait. That is America, baby. But what's more important is he tried his hand at a lot of different hobbies. Architecture. He designed his own home in Monticello. He played the violin. He kept mockingbirds. He collected fossils. And, most relevant of all, he hoarded a culture. In his extensive garden, he kept 330 types of vegetables and 170 types of fruit. I didn't know One this. of those fruits was grapes. Oh yeah, of course. So he tried his hand I really at viticulture. And while he was good at a lot of things, he never saw much success with making wine. So he mostly collected the stuff. Now people naturally wondered, like hey, what happened to the wine he made and the wine he collected? If that wine still exists, I wonder how many millions that goes. I bet nobody will ever drink it and just keep it. Cause wow. Did he sell it all? Did he give it away? Did he attempt the huge caress? Fast forward, 1985. Meet German It was ripped music. for the time? He was 188 and... Wait, wait, was he actually ripped? Was he actually like a super giga chad? That is insane. And 188 meter, if you're like overly ripped, uh, uh, being 188, 188 meter, like over six feet, that is, d d that's, that requires work, man. Producer Hardy Rodenstock. He is an avid wine collector. And he's tapping on the walls of old buildings in Paris, looking for some national treasures. On this occasion, the wall opened and, my God. Sealed behind, he said that he found a collection of 24 bottles, dating all the way back to the 1780s. That and, is a lot of money. <gasps> look at that. THJ engraved right there on the glass. Thomas Jefferson. What if this is just some random bozo called T. Thon Johnson or something like that? <laughs> It seems like Mr. Rodenstock has stumbled upon Jeff's hidden collection. Mystery solved. And it would make sense that they wound up in France because Jefferson spent a number of years over there. Amazing. And into Rodenstock's wine collection, they went. Now, Rodenstock's wine collection was something quite special, and he liked to show it off. So every year he would host tasting events that featured extremely rare wines. And he would invite all the most prominent German celebrities such as the Hans Brothers, and Das Boot, Wurst. and Death Stranding. Mm. Now, one of his guests was a guy named Michael Broadbent, the senior director for Christie's Auction House. 
Together, they cracked open one of the THJ bottles. Bottle number one. Broadbent said that the wine was delicious. Yup, these bottles are in perfect condition, he said. You should really auction these things. I run an auction, you should put them in there. Huh. Maybe I should, Zoom in. said yeah. Mr. Rodenstock. Maybe I should. But before they did that, they sold two of the bottles privately. Number two and number three. And they drank a fourth. On the 5th of December, 1985, they put up bottle number five for auction at Christie's. It was December 1985, so this is a while ago. Because I'm like thinking, how many millions would this go for now? I feel like it would be a lot. It was bought by Christopher Forbes for 105 I was a baby boy? Have you ever thought to yourself, like, isn't it crazy? Like, I hate having these thoughts. But whenever you think to yourself about a date and you didn't exist then... You were not born. I don't know why, but that kind of mindset, whenever I like put my head like really into it, it fucks me up. I don't know why. It's just like, it is wild to think about how many things has happened in the eternity, like all of life before you were born. And they're just thinking about like, what is going to happen after you're gone as well? What were my ancestors doing? Yeah, what the hell? <laughs> No, I was. It's not really about. I mean, it's funny to think about what your answers were doing as well, but it's just the fact that you didn't exist at this time and you're existing now. Just that Thanks. mindset is so trippy to me. Which at the time meant it was the most expensive bottle of wine ever sold. But that wine wasn't to drink. Proudly, that thing sat on the Forbes shelf, eventually to be put into the Forbes gallery in the exhibit on former presidents. And funnily enough, they it's weird. This yeah, on it fucks me up. Big industrial I don't know. Lights, and it heated the thing something fierce, and the heat ruined its drinkability. Of course, in fact, so intense was the light that the glass expanded and the cork fell into the bottle. That sucks. Some time passed. They celebrated the sale with another drink. Bottle number Wait, six. Wait, how much did they sell it for? And then they sold two more privately. So you're telling me in 2013 it only went for $146,000? $84,000? Oh. Wait, what? For about 30,000 USD? For 50,000 USDs? I feel like this would be a lot more. Like, yeah. You can barely see it, but I feel like a wine made by Thomas Jefferson? I feel like that should go for a lot of money. I don't know. In 1987, they drank bottle number nine. 1988, Such an they drank American historical 10. figure. And at this point, a new challenger enters the sea. The White Wolf of Palm Beach. They call him Why, are Bill you banned, uh, Some say Jimmy? it's short for billionaire. He's a member of one of the wealthiest families in America. No, you're not banned. And he is also one of the world's most avid collectors of wine. So they Campbell's sell him a total of four bottles for three hundred and eleven thousand eight hundred and four dollars. We're way God damn. Over here on the graph at this point. So, gently, careful, careful now. He put them in his climate controlled cellar. And he would show them off to his friends. Otherwise, here they remained for the next seventeen years. As the years ticked by, more bottles were sold and more bottles were consumed until there were none left. 2005. The four Coke bottles had sat Imagine around. drinking cheap wine, yeah. How could you... I, I, how could you drink cheap wine when you have Tom or Jefferson wine right here? For a long time. My lord. Doing nothing. When something new happened. The Boston Museum of Fine Arts was interested in displaying the bottles and wanted to trace the exact provenance. So Coke gets on the line with the Jefferson Foundation and he goes, oh, look, I don't mean to brag, but I'm about to have my bottles displayed at the Boston Museum. But I need just a little bit of verification. Could you tell me exactly where these bottles come from? And the Thomas Jefferson Foundation responded, oh, I'm afraid we can't do that. We don't think they're real. Wouldn't that be interesting? After so long, 
uh, they would not be real after drinking all of them after selling a couple for thousands of thousands of dollars and now after like three or four decades saying they are not real yeah in fact you're not the only person to call about this what yes it was in the 80s a mr broadbent i believe of Christie's Auction House called up trying to verify the bottles so that he could sell them. But we looked through our comprehensive historical records and found no mention of these bottles. Here's a letter we sent saying that we couldn't verify them and they're probably fake. But, 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 huh? but, 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 but he sold those bottles to me. <gasps> Ooh. Now, that's Come to 1776. And the worst part is that this is so big part of our apartheid, the guy might be even dead. Now, here's a thing you should know about Jefferson. <laughs> Let's just say, if he was around today, he would play a lot of Factorio. It oh, was, he's that kind know, of guy. And I have the largest collection of Funko Pops in the world. And that meant that his record keeping was very meticulous. All of his anime was ordered alphabetic, mm. and so too were all the things that he ever... See, the America was founded upon anime and weebs. Can you believe that, guys? See, they can't be no no American allowed to have any hate toward weebs because the whole foundation of freedom has been built upon about the the idea of mangas. So you gotta respect Purchased. it, including wine. <laughs> so that's my story, Mister Pepsi, and those Mr. bottles Pepsi. are probably fake. When Coke hears about this, he hangs up the phone and hits speed dial on his pager or something. I didn't even and figure this out this late. A team, a team of investigators. Mr. Rodenstock lived in Germany. So, Coke's investigators scoured the countryside for clues. And eventually they found a lead. They managed to track down five German residents who claimed to have done engraving work for Rodenstock in the past. They said, hey, have you seen these bottles before? And they went, oh yeah, we have. We did those. And all five were certain that the THJ engravings were done by an electric power tool. Every one of these 24 bottles of Jefferson wine. No way. Big fat phonies. Holy. Allegedly, allegedly, allegedly. So Bill takes all of this evidence to court and Rodenstock is summoned, but he doesn't show up. So Bill wins in absentia and is awarded a million bucks. In the end, Bill never received any money from Rodenstock. But to Bill, it was about sending a message more than receiving any money. I'm coming after you. And it's just one battle of many that Bill has fought against counterfeit wine. In 2008, Coke what a filed battle a to consumer go for. fraud lawsuit against the Chicago Wine Company, which was later settled out of court. Another time, Coke spent $3.5 million buying nearly 2,700 bottles of wine from Zaki's auction house. Almost a third of a million dollars worth was fake. The auction house settled out of court, but the seller was told to pay 379,000. This guy has an interesting business. So he goes to auctions to find fake, just to basically bid on everything he can and then see how big of a percentile, taking a gamble that some of them are fake to go into court with them. Man. It really does tell you that there's business everywhere. That is pretty cool. That's an interesting, that's an interesting market. Thousand huh. dollars in damages and another thousand dollars for every bottle. But then the next day they went, you know what? We thought about it. This jury has decided to award you $12 million in punitive damages. Easy damage. clap. Jackpot, said Mr. Coke. I'm rich. <laughs> but a year later, the court changed its mind and awarded Coke only $711,000. I mean, it's still money. Okay, so this guy's like a one-man army and he's going around trying to scare the shit out of anyone <laughs> who's selling fake wine. <laughs> oh, you've got expensive rare wine, do you? Uh, <laughs> yeah, I'll buy it. Nobody yeah, want to talk no, to him. Yeah, I'll buy it. No, it's fine. It's genuine, is it? Yeah, you're saying it's genuine. Yeah, definitely. And then he goes and he inspects it, then finds it's fake, and then goes, yeah, I knew all along, stupid. Lawsuit time. By doing this, he's very slowly cleaning up the market. After all of these investigations, One man saving Bill the wine has spent market. around $35 million tracking down fake wine. But by 2016, Coke was ready to lay down his weapons. He sold off a big chunk of his collection, and it sold for $22 million. Damn! Which means 
he likely did not break even. So consider giving to his GoFundMe. Now, this is actually just a very small part of the story. This scandal ended up making such waves across the wine industry that they decided to make a movie about it. Based on the Benjamin Wallace book, The Billionaire's Vinegar. And it was set to star Brad Pitt. No, wait. Now it's Matthew McConaughey. Mm. No, wait. It looks like it's cancelled. Oh, okay. Classic. All right, that's the video. Thanks for watching. Four more to go, but we've already started in on the regular type stuff in case you don't love fancy. Okay, bye. And don't forget, that is a good video. Slash incognito. Hi, thank you so much for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please like the video and subscribe. I'll post videos nearly every day, so if you want to watch any more reactions, feel free to subscribe and I'll see you there.